Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're located. Uh, I'm Chris Brewer, Customer Development Manager for Lean Scheduling International. We're so glad you've taken some time out of your busy schedules to join us today for this webinar, which is Advanced Planning and Scheduling for the Food and Beverage Industry. We are set for one hour today where we'll walk through Op Center APS, formerly known as Preactor Advanced Planning and Scheduling. And we're going to show you solutions to those common planning and scheduling headaches that you all face in uh, F and B. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, we're going to pause periodically, giving you the opportunity to ask questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or by sending us a message through the chat window. Alongside me today is Hans Albright and Fraser Bonnet. Uh, with 30 years of experience in manufacturing systems, Hans has spent the last 20 years both selling and implementing effective APS and ERP solutions. Hans brings real-world manufacturing and consulting experience to the table. He has a long history of commitment to partnering with clients to ensure long-term, mutually beneficial relationships, and he now serves as our Vice President of Sales and Marketing here at LSI. And we've got Fraser Bonnet. He quite possibly has more experience with Op Center APS than anyone in North America. After serving 10 years in the uh, United States Air Force as a program manager, followed by a number of years with Raytheon, uh, he spent the last 23 years delivering Op Center APS, again, formerly known as Preactor, same product, different name. Um, to make sure that uh, we make good use of our time today, I'm going to go ahead and just get this turned over to Hans. So, Hans, if you're ready, take it away. All right. That's great. Uh, I'd just like to confirm that everyone can hear me. I can. All right. I heard that. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. As Chris said, um, we just want to go ahead and let's get going. So, to begin with, um, I am going to share with you the agenda that we came up with today. So I'm going to go through a few slides. I'm going to introduce you to Op Center APS, to LSI, um, talk a little bit about some of the challenges, food and beverage industry, um, and then we're going to go ahead and jump in and start going through um, an APS demonstration. So the way this is going to look is um, once I get through my introductory slides, I'm going to turn it over to Fraser, who is going to do a little bit about the basics, introduce uh, Op Center APS, and then he's going to show um, what it looks like one solution for scheduling ovens and, you know, the, the complexities around that. Um, and then I'm, he's going to turn it back over to me. I'm going to um, show uh, how we can use uh, the capacity of tanks and bins in a schedule um, as a constraining factor. And then I'm going to open a second model, and we're going to look at uh, allergen management, um, wave scheduling, and a number of other complexities. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much the plan that we have, so let's go ahead and get started. So to begin with, um, you know, just talking about the food and beverage industry, there's a lot going on. And, you know, people are demanding different products. Uh, they don't want preservatives in their food. Uh, people are shopping differently these days. A lot of e-commerce and things which drives packaging changes. Uh, food safety regulations are constantly there. Um, issues with the workforce and labor unforeseen events like COVID-19, and all of these things work together uh, to affect your schedule in some way. And, you know, as it is, your work is complex and mistakes are really consequential. So it's important that you're able to manage this and do it in an easy way that is, that is going to help you meet all of those stringent guidelines that you need to adhere to. So that brings us to Op Center APS. So with this one slide, I just want to introduce a little bit about the product, a little bit of history. So on the left-hand side, um, you can see that Op Center APS has been around a, a long time, and it is the largest um, of any independent uh, planning scheduling software um, product out there in the market. Um, and you can see the numbers. Lots of people around the world have bought this and implemented it. Um, and in North America, there are quite a few as well. So moving over to the center where you see all of these logos and the industries that these logos come from, you can see that OpCenter is very well used with some pretty big, well-known companies, and it goes across lots of different industries. And this is a testament to the flexibility of this product, that it can be configured to meet the specific needs of all of these different industries without ever touching the core code of the product. And we'll get into that in a few moments. So OpCenter APS, formerly Preactor, um, is made up of two components. Um, at the top on the right-hand side, you see visual finite scheduling. That's what we're going to be focusing on most today. 
but then also visual long-term planning. And I am going to address this, um, but I want you to know I'm not going to show this live today. I'm not going to show the planning live. However, reach out to me, and I'll be glad to work with you and uh, get you a, uh, a demo that would you know, address some of the issues that you're dealing with. And then at the bottom, I just want to talk briefly about Lean Scheduling International. Um, we've got a lot of experience here, um, and the people in our company have been doing this for over 25 years. And in North America, we've got the largest install base. Um, roughly 80% of the uh, installs of Preactor in North America are customers of ours. Okay, so we have quite a few customers in the food industry, and that's what this logo is showing. These are some of our North American customers. There may be some there that you recognize. For all I know, you you currently work for some of them. And um, so um, just so that you understand, you can see there are different types of food manufacturing in there as well. Again, it's a very flexible product. So talking about then how UpCenter APS works, you know, you might be thinking, well, you know, I've got an ERP system, I've got an MRP system, and, and, and that's good. I mean, you need that. But Preactor, even though it can stand alone, most typically when it is deployed, it's integrated with an ERP system. So we take from the ERP orders, bonds, routes, product information, and bring that into the schedule where we can also bring in information from your, man from your manufacturing execution system, preventative maintenance systems. You may have some other process manufacturing type systems on your floor. And for what's relevant, we can bring that into the schedule. The schedule is, is worked and then the uh, dates and so forth are passed back up to the ERP system. And this is very typical um, of the way this is deployed. As far as the product itself is built, there is this core, and I, I alluded to this earlier, there's this core of the product that is only um, manageable by the folks at Siemens, and this is code that none of us as partners can ever touch. Um, it's off limits to us, and we can't even get near it. Um, Siemens will upgrade this a couple of times per year, and when they do, it's really somewhat of a non-event. The years that I spent in ERP, um, an upgrade could be months. It could take months to do an upgrade in some cases. With this, we might be looking at half a day, sometimes less, to do an upgrade. And that's because all of the custom work that we do for you is in this modeling layer and is never touched and is not affected when we upgrade this core code. So really, once this is upgraded, there's a little bit of testing to make sure that everything's hooked up right, that it's doing what it should do, and you're on your way. So as far as what this modeling layer is made up of, I've kind of, we have it broken out into four different areas here. Um, so it allows you to do scripting, right? All versions can have scripts, um, scheduling rules, material rules that modify behavior uh, to target specific customer problems. And this is where a lot of the customization is done. Um, in addition to that, we have these user DLLs that can come in and this would be custom code uh, to access the API and, and do what we need to, to further get this refined to do what we want it, what you need it to do. So, uh, you know, an example might be um, making it so that you can drag an operation from one line to another, and it will dynamically adjust the scrap rate, scrap rate on the fly. Or maybe the ability to drag one job to another and have the two of them merge into one larger job. This is the type of work that we use uh, that we're able to, to do this through the API to, uh, to customize for your needs. The top right, I have the data definition, and this is talking about how uh, we're able to define every table, and we can add or modify tables, incorporate staging tables, et cetera. And then finally, on the bottom right, the user experience, um, the menus and objects in the interface um, can be um, moved around, turned on, made visible, changed, et cetera, in order to, um, to have a different user experience for different users. So that's the essence of how the product is built and, and how we modify it to fit, understanding that we never affect that core code, and so upgrades are a very easy process. So I talked about it being planning and scheduling, and those are two terms that often um, people use interchangeably. So when we talk about planning, we're talking about what to make, when to make it, how much to make, and where to make it, as well as the materials and resources required. That's the plan. But the schedule is how do we execute that plan? 
And that gets down into the nitty gritty day to day um, decisions um, and often right down to the minute uh, changes that occur and being able to, to uh, respond to that quickly. So the planning and the scheduling have two different functions and that's why they're, they're broken out in that way. So look at this a different way. Um, if you look at the top, the planning, um, often people will use the planning to rough cut a schedule or rough cut a plan um, and they will go out years doing this into buckets that could be months or they could be weeks or they could be days. Um, but they, they will take orders and plan them out over a long period of time. Um, whereas with the schedule, people typically go out months, maybe sometimes just weeks, um, some cases only a day or two, um, but this can get right down to the very minute in the, that fine detail um, that we're talking about in the schedule. So two different products that accomplish two different things, but work together seamlessly. So the planning and the way that's typically deployed is that people will, um, even though advanced planning, uh, signified by AP here, can stand alone, most typically people will do the planning, do a longer term rough cut plan, and then at a predetermined time that is a part of the uh, configuration decisions that are made, we'll pass that information down to the schedule at the plant level, and then where the schedule then is executed into production. So planning into time buckets, managing raw material shelf life, all of those things we're able to do um, in, you know, use an AP tool, but we can also plan capacity across multiple sites. And that's where then you, you get a big advantage to advanced planning. If you have multiple plants that are producing the same products, you can put those under one um, AP model and it can, it can balance the load and distribute the work to all of the plants. So what that looks like uh, from a capacity planning, this is a, an image taken from advanced planning where I have some unplanned capacity and I'm comparing two different plants, two different plants that I'm going to work with here. In the top one, the blue, and in the bottom, the yellow, indicates the available capacity. And if you'll notice the yellow down there, uh, the, the time, there's actually a bump in capacity, and this is for seasonality. So you're able to do that to reflect what your true capacity is in a plant. And then using algorithms in the plant, you can, you can work it out and decide you know, exactly what is important to you and how you want it to plan the capacity, but it can essentially load balance between the plants and make sure that you can do everything within the available capacity that you have. And if you don't, it's a long enough term thing that you can make some decisions to increase your capacity, offload some work, et cetera. So it's a very good tool for um, an enterprise as well as a single plant, depending on your needs. So that's all I'm gonna talk about planning today. And I'm inviting you then to, uh, to contact me if you'd like to learn more about it. And um, I'll be glad to, to share more information with you, give you a live demo, et cetera. Okay, so on to Op Center APS scheduling, advanced scheduling. These are the food and beverage scheduling challenges that we're going to focus on and address today, as well as a lot of other things that you'll see in the process just by uh, passively by watching how we use the tool. Um, but scheduling ovens, as I mentioned, Fraser's gonna talk about that. Um, addressing raw material availability, shelf life, all of these things are important. Um, and you'll see those uh, early on here. And then managing tanks and bins um, and addressing the fact of resource relationships and supply lines where we have fixed, we have these fixed relationships that can be, that can present some challenges. Um, sequencing around the allergens and all the other things in ways that we have to segregate one food type from another and then bi-directional uh, scheduling from a packaging line or some other uh, bottleneck point in your process. Okay, so that's what we're gonna address today. And at this point, I'm going to um, stop my section here and I'm going to pass it off to Fraser who's going to jump in and, um, and take have a go at it. Um, I probably should stop. I told Chris that we would stop after every section just to see if we had some questions. So um, I'll toss that out to you, Chris, and I will stop sharing so Fraser can pick it up. Hey, yes. Um, 
uh, that was great, Hans. Thanks for, for leading us through that. We do have some questions that have already started to kind of come through, uh, but based on, on their topic, I'm going to wait and let Fraser dig into the detail a bit, and then uh, because some of them are, will be covered in the demonstration. So uh, if you do have questions, uh, again, feel free to put them in the um, the Q&A section below by hitting the Q&A button or by sending it through the chat. Uh, Fraser, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Chris. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start simply um, with a simple foods demo and just highlight how it's built, the kind of things that we put into a model. Um, and, and essentially what we're after is we're trying to simulate your production environment. So the way we get to do that is the first thing we do is look at the actual resources. So we got a very simple one here, kitchen, tumble, cook, chill, and meal assembly. So we're going to make some sort of prepackaged meals in this model. What you want to schedule, what you want to actually have capacity defined for would be your resources. So we'll model those. And we've got groups, which is not point talking about this one, but it's essentially the same thing. The resources are going to actually produce something. Um, We've got orders that would typically come from an ERP system. Obviously, I'm, I don't have one here. I'm just using it as a standalone demo, but a series of orders that we've got, I'm actually in the wrong one. This is supply. These are the supplies that we're gonna pull from, sorry. So we've got purchase orders and stock items with quantities, their availability date, all the kinds of stuff that you would have in your ERP system to feed Preactor so that it knows when things are available to be used as, a, as an ingredient, for example. Um, we have our work orders. So we're actually building um, these quote um, repackaged meals here. This is our routings. So we would take our routing from your ERP system as well, as long as any other bill material information that says, you know, for the pork chop dinner, we need, um, you know, pork chop, obviously a roll of salad and all that stuff kind of comes together. So the whole point behind this is to simulate your production environment as uh, along with the actual data that you have in your ERP system. And we pull that down, you know, using um, SQL connect commands to get data at various different options. So given all that, we'll import the orders and then we'll go into the schedule. We'll talk about this for a second. So right in the middle of your screen, we have the typical Gantt chart. And these again are your um, resources that we're going to schedule. This is our supply line. So each one of these supply lines has four records here and they are POs, okay, for various items. So this one is a PO for broccoli, which is one of the mixed veg, which is one of the supply things that we need to build. Um, down at the bottom screen, um, I'm also tracking labor. So each one of these operations, not everyone, but most of the operations have assigned an <coughs> operator to actually run that operation. So we need to keep track of that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a schedule and we're, we're gonna keep track of the number of operators we have and never schedule anything initially for more people than you actually have. So that's a real world constraint that you would build into your model so that you don't create schedules that are kind of pointless. So we'll go ahead and sequence. Now when I take a look at sequence, this is quite a few options here. I've got forwards and backwards sequencing. I've got priorities and due dates. I've got bi-directional. I've got all kinds of stuff here. Um, this is the end goal of what you want. So most people are taking in orders with a customer promise date. And that's most, I say probably 90% of our customers are just saying, look, just get a schedule done that meets those due dates and also deal with change over times and allergens and all that kind of stuff and um, you know that's built into a, a food model. For right now, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a simple forwards by due date. So we'll just get stuff on the board. And if we take a look at, I'll take a look at just one, any one order sequence by itself. Oh, whoops, all previous operations. So you can see how these operations are linked so there's tumble, cook, and chill. There's the assembly down there, which I missed. And you can see that this one is actually, the dotted line here actually represents it's coming from a supply item. So not only can I um, schedule, but I'm also taking into account when things are going to be available. So I'm not trying to tell the guys on the floor in the production sequence, start this job when you don't have all the pieces of material in. Um, the operators were assigned, and we can just take a quick look as it's highlighting on the top. We can see where operators are being assigned. There was none there. There's some there. So it's just, it's just a visual thing to, to let you know that, you know, you are actually assigning operators to jobs. Um, a couple of other notices. The uh, last two jobs, the last assembly jobs here are because they've got the little red line and their font is red. That tells me that those particular jobs are late. And in fact, you can see that they are trying to meet a sales order down here and the little red, again, red is bad in pre land, which means you're late. So 
given all that, we've got a great schedule. And if we take a look at our statistics, we can see that our schedule span is three days, seven hours, and 30 minutes. And that's basically, in this simple demo, how long it takes to get from the first job to the last job. One of the things we often get asked is, well, you're limited to the number of operators, but what if I had more operators? What can we do? So one of the things we'll do, just to demonstrate, we'll disable that constraint. So now I'm actually going to run unconstrained, and we'll see what that does for us. And visually, you can tell immediately it's different. If you look down on the plot, you can see we're using three, four, three, four. We're using a lot more operators to, to accomplish that schedule. And if we take a look at our statistics, we've knocked ourselves down to under three days. Okay, so more people obviously would allow us to get more, more work done. And I have a lot of customers who will use this if they're in seasonal type work, when they're wanting to look at, okay, so we need to ramp up our our production, we need to make these things quicker, how many people do I need? And this is a tool that can give them those numbers of how many people they actually need. So it's very useful in that way. Um, another typical question we get, if I take a look at this particular job right here, it's a mix of veg, you see it is pinged up or connected up to this PO, PO number 11. And a question we often get is, well, if I'm updating that PO, let's say customer service is contacted by our supplier, and says that PO is gonna be late. You know, how does that affect my schedule? So I'll actually demonstrate that by editing that PO and we'll make it, just make it a day late. Okay, immediately see as soon as I made it a day late, this font went green, which is telling me that I'm starting this job too early because it requires that PO that is actually over here. So you could sit here and manually move drags, dogs, or, uh, jobs around to get it to be fixed. But we have a simple tool, which basically will go in, it goes to my other screen, a schedule repair, which is going to get everything back into sequence. And we'll see what the effect of that is as soon as I hit OK. It moved it to the 14th, and it basically is telling me now I'm going to have four jobs that are late because they are dependent on this mixed veg component being a part of the meal assembly. Um, so that's just a demonstration of it, when data changes in the host system, we can feed that into Preactor. And we can um, reflect what, you know, we, we can get the, um, the, the effect or the, you know, the problem caused by things like job, you know, suppliers being late and things like that. So um, that's kind of a very simple um, thing. I want to show one more thing. Um, if I take a look at this last meal assembly here, we have something called the material explorer, which basically you can trace back through each step. So here's my sales order for 20. Um, we're seeing that it it's requiring, um, Sam, it's a salmon one. Salmon, salad, rice, pilaf, and mixed veg. Those are also coming from work orders. I can actually look at this job right here and see that I'm actually short on something. So we can download information from our ERP system, but if things are missing, um, you know, this would be a cause for concern. I'm supposed to have some kind of spice mix. So this kind of information would go back to, you know, who is running your ERP system. Say, hey, why, why is this short? It could be a data issue. It really could be short. If it's something not to worry about, we ignore it. If it's something is to worry about, then we can go find that particular spice mix and you know tell tell the um, the production guys, look, you, when this job pops up, don't don't run it because you're missing something. But all the information is here. There's all kinds of tools that you can use to to generate that kind of information. Once you've actually saved the schedule and you're happy with it, to communicate that schedule to the production floor. There's various um, reports that we use. Um, this is a simple report. Uh, they're all SQL Server reports, a, a dispatch list. So this is for the guy who is running, the operator who's running the tumble machine. These are the machine, the operations he's going to run. They are listed by time, and that is his dispatch list. Now, we often, I have customers who just print it out. I have customers who will take this information and will stick it back into a staging table that can be picked up by their MRP system or ERP system, and it can be electronic displayed on a, you know, on a, a computer screen next to the guy's workstation. But um, the information is essentially here and we can do what we need to with it. Each one of these resources has the same kind of dispatch list. And as you saw, there's a whole boatload of other, other reports that we have access to, but we won't get much more detail on that. So that's basically a simple couple of items to show, operators being used and being maxed out, POs being uh, changed. Um, I'll get into a little more detail in the next one. So to any, uh, Chris, I'll pause here to see if there yeah. are any questions. Absolutely. We've had a few come through. Okay. Uh, and this one is very timely. 
Um, we have uh, one participant that says, with COVID-19, we had to shut down several lines based on availability of employees. Okay. How hard is it to shut down a line and reschedule everything on it? It's very easy. Um, there's, and the thing about Preactor, there's about nine different ways to do the same thing. One off way is to edit the calendar. Now, each one of these resources has a calendar associated with it. Now, currently, it's on some template called a working day, so eight to five or something like that. We can actually put it on breakdown. We'll call it breakdown. And we can say we're going to start it there and we're going to finish it um, on the 13th. Let's, let's, let's say the 15th. We'll put five days on it. So I'm basically just going to shut it down. And you see the first thing it did, it just pushed all these jobs out because I shut it down for so long. They're still there. This, this particular model is not going to be very smart because I only have one tumble operation prepared. If I, and it's basically affected everything. If I had another tumbling machine, when I repaired it, I could have had those jobs rescheduled on tumbling machine number two. So I can shut a machine down very easily by edit editing the calendar. And if I had another machine, I could you know, bring these orders back in. It wouldn't affect things too much. This model being so simple, things just have to wait. Very good. Okay. Um, we have one more before you move on. Uh, it's, it's similar. Uh, we have lines that require stopping and doing a complete clean out after X amount of hours running. Sure. Can that be worked in for some lines and not others? And if so, can those times differ? Uh, yes to all. Um, the last time I encountered something like this was actually not in foods. It was in a, a metal stamping area. And each time this, the metals got stamped, we had to count the number of stampings. And after 5,000 stampings, we had to stop the, stop the line and change out, the, change out the stamp because it got worn down. So we use, if you remember back on Hans's slide, he mentioned the API. So we would use the API for that. And for any resource that we define, we can set it up so that we keep track of, it could be hours running or products being produced or whatever it is till we get to a certain point. And then we would force into it, okay, we've reached that point. Now we can, one of the options is there's simply to schedule a job that says clean up for eight hours. And we can do that. It's just a matter of using the API. That's all a matter of understanding the, the requirements and what it is you're trying to achieve. We'll use the API to make it happen. Very good. All okay. right, keep the questions coming. We'll go ahead and move forward to the other model, Fraser. All righty. So this one is going to demonstrate pretty, pretty much just one feature. I need to get the right one here. Yes, ovens. So this one's a little more complex in the number of machines that it has, but it's still got prep and injection, or maybe donuts or something. But you notice we've got, in this case, three bake ovens, okay? So an oven in most food industries, if, unless it's a Lear, um, you're opening a door and you're putting stuff inside it, and then you're closing the door and leaving it for an hour, two hours, whatever it is, before you open the door again. Now, if you had this kind of information in a typical scheduler that comes bundled with an ERP system, again, you're looking at scheduling forwards by due date. So I'll go ahead and do this forwards by due date. Standard preactor um, or standard ERP kind of scheduling. But if you'll notice the bake oven, they're staggered. Okay, so something arrived and the, the, the data said, put it in the oven. Okay, great. But then something else arrived and data said, put it in the oven. We haven't finished with this one yet. So Essentially what's happening is we keep opening the door and we can't have that. So what you really want to have happen is something like this. You really want to have them lined up like that so that when you reach whatever limit you have defined, and this one is the, each oven is defined just by a, a quantity, I think. Um, it can be defined by racks or anything like that. When we reach that limit, then we open the door and we put all the product in it. So there's two things going on here. First of all, um, this one, I believe, has a three-hour time limit in, in front of the oven door. So if something arises, something arrives, it cannot wait more than three hours to get in there. So in that case, we'll just open the door and put it in. But if, it's not, if it waits less than that, we want them all to be lined up so you open the door at one time. And the whole point of this is when you take that, this schedule information and you do, in fact, create dispatch lists, and send the results of the schedule somewhere. We want it to be as close as possible to the actual thing that happens on the production floor. We don't want to send them the staggered opening and closing of the door because that just confuses everybody on the floor. So what we want to do is simulate what really, really happens in the production environment. So what we do, we use that API that Hans mentioned, and we write an oven rule. Before I do that, I actually want to turn animation on so it looks a little bit more fun. 
we'll go ahead and use the APS rule, oven rule, which basically will see that something has shown up, but then wait for something else. And actually, as you watch this, you'll see jobs sort of gradually creeping to the right. And that is them delaying the door opening until we get all finished. So actually, you can spot some of these. As soon as they show up, sometimes they move a little bit to the right. They're being delayed while other stuff shows up. And obviously, scheduling doesn't take this long. I turned animation on just to make it more interesting. Usually, you wouldn't run that. It does slow things down. But you can see immediately, we're getting right to where we need to be. Now that we've done the centerpiece of the bake ovens, we go back and refresh all the other upstream and downstream projects until we're finished. So now, everything is lined up perfectly in the ovens. So we take a look at the bottom one here. The delay buffer time on that one is zero hours. So that was most likely the last job that showed up that met that limit of what could fit in the oven. So we look above it, there was an hour and 40 minutes, there's two hours and 30 minutes, and there's 50 minutes. So all of these machines, all oh, machines, all these jobs arrived in front of the bake oven, and because we didn't have that limit met yet, they kind of waited there, still less than three hours, which is good, they wouldn't wait longer than that. And then once they finally met that, whatever the, that limit was be, and if we take a look in our plots, we see that the bake oven usage in number two has 125, I don't know, pieces, we'll call it pieces. So we have that limit and then we ran out, we actually got close enough that we could have gone, oh, open the door and put stuff in. And you can see all the bake ovens are now doing that. Okay, so it's all lined up. And in this case here, um, you know, on this bake oven number one, the other jobs were coming in so late that we had to open the, job, open the door and start to stick it in. So that's really just a, a simple feature that we run into all the time with um with food customers um and that's how we build it we have it we use an api to build that kind of logic into the system any more questions chris very good very good yes um we've got one here it says does an operation have to complete entirely before the next operation can start right i'll zoom in here a little bit now forget that we're using ovens um, if we take a look at one of these jobs here under, um, I think it's operation times, no, it's attributes, there it is. We have a concept in here of transfers, okay? So in this particular model, everything is set to a transfer full quantity, which means if I've got a thousand pieces here on this operation, the next operation has a thousand pieces, I gotta do all thousand in the first one until I move to the second one. We have the option of setting something called a transfer quantity, I'll go back to my 1,000, I will now say that after I've made 100 pieces in that first op, I can then transfer over to that next op. So it ends up kind of looking like, say this was op 10, this was op 20, this would be full transfer, but now we're gonna do something closer to that. This is not gonna work right here because I got, I'm just trying to use it wrong. So here we go. So that this would be from 1420 to 1410, I'm actually gonna transfer as soon as I've made 100 pieces. And that gets you more into the flow. If you're more batch processing, you probably won't run into that. But if you're more into a flow, like if you're making drinks, um, that would be typical of a problem of not in a bake oven, obviously, but you know, from a tank, you don't necessarily wait till the whole thing fills before you, you know, start feeding the bottling lines. You wait till you transfer at some point. Both options are available. Good. All right. I have two more quick questions here. One, um, after a product comes out of an oven, is it possible to delay the next operation from starting for X amount of hours to allow it to cool down? Yep, absolutely. Inside Preactive, we have what we call these advanced timing features that we can use. So um, here's one, typically a maximum time before next op. So if you have something, this is in food industry, if you're mixing something that has a very short shelf life, you have to make sure that the next operation, whatever it is, happens within five minutes or 10 hours or whatever it happens to be. Slack time after last operation would say, I've done this operation, I must wait X amount of time for it to cool down. So without actually putting in an actual res um, job for cool down, you can use these timing things to make sure that the next job doesn't start for two hours or something like that. Excellent. And um, last one here before we move on, um, it says in many F&B industries, they use the concept of batch. Can you manage the creation of the batches required to produce a certain amount of a finished good? Yes. Um, so typically, as we mentioned before, we take all the work order stuff from the ERP system. So if batch size calculations have not been done in your ERP system, if they're just giving us a quantity, 
given the logic that we need to make those batch sizes, um, we can sort of pre-process the order or post-process the order, depending on how you look at it. Once it's come down from ERP, we can apply that logic to the orders and create the batches to be scheduled inside Preactor. It's all a matter of just understanding what the equations are and getting the right result. And we would use that API again for that. Excellent. Great questions. Uh, I think we're ready to go ahead and, and move forward. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Back to Holmes. Great. Okay. And I will pick it up. Okay, very good. All right, so as promised, now I'm going to start talking a little bit about uh, about tanks and bins. Um, and what I have here is a model that is um, a dairy. It's a very simple, uh, very simple dairy. But but the top resource up here is a pasteurization uh, pasteurization process where they're pasture. You know, they're doing you know skim milk, two percent whole milk, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so forth down the line. And then from there, once something goes through the pasteurizer, it goes into a pasteurization tank where it's held until it begins to be drawn off and goes into the fillers. So, you know, if they're filling jugs or small cartons, containers, that type of thing, depending on what it is. So what we've done with this is use the, the, the same tool that we used for operators to simulate tanks. So instead of saying, uh, as Fraser showed, that we have two um, setup operators available. Um, we have a tank with a 10,000 gallon capacity, um, another one with a 12,000, a 6,000, a 6,000, et cetera. So what happens then is as something is pasteurized and then is passed down into one of these tanks, you can see where it is rising to a certain level and holding. And then if another order comes in, it rises even further and holds until it begins to be drawn off. So to see this in a little more uh, vivid detail and, you know, what that, uh, what that looks like, I'm just going to put a couple on manually so that you can see what this looks like uh, in, actually, I'll just say it in slow motion. So to put it on the board, um, if I put that on and uh, let's see if I can move in just a little bit, make that a little bit bigger so we can follow what's going on here. Um, so what basically what we're seeing here is that I've been able to put an order in here that is um, it's going through the pasteurizer and then it goes into the pasteurization tank. So the process here of where it goes into the tank and comes up and it fills the tank. All right. And now I didn't put in the next operation that draws it down or it's actually it's out of view. It's way down here. You can see it's not starting until 5 a.m. When the, uh, when the crew comes in at 5 a.m., we started here at midnight. So this sits and waits until the crew comes in at 5 a.m. and begins to draw this off and fill the, uh, you know, the tanks in the machine that is putting these into one gallons. So that kind of gives you an idea of what, the, um, of what it looks like when, uh, actually I'll pull that in a little tighter, and you can see the whole process. And I'm actually going to do this compress overview. That makes it a little simpler to see. So what I've done now is I've hit this little button that allows me to compress and focus on a job and it takes all of the other resources out of view so that I can see it more clearly. So if I put in a second order, then you're able to see what that looks like as I go forward on that one. And you can see in this case, it dropped it down to another tank down here. If I go and add yet another order, um, that one is one that also went down into this pasteurization tank number one. And whereas the capacity before was showing 4,000 gallons, which was the quantity of that order, 30, yeah, 4,000, we now have another one going in with an additional 3,600, taking it up almost to 8,000 gallons. So it will continue to, to do this and to fill. And the, the key is that when we schedule, we are saying we have a fixed capacity of these tanks. So if it can't fit an order into a tank, because it's already full and it hasn't yet enough has not been drawn up to begin filling it. Um, it's either not going to schedule or it's going to find another place that it is allowed to go into. So that's the idea behind the tanks and bins. Um, there's certainly a lot more that, that could be shown here, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to get into it too much um, because I want to spend, you know, I want to reserve time for the next thing I have. But if we do have anybody on here who is doing anything with, um, 
with tanks, with beverages, uh, dairy, that type of thing, or maybe you're doing something with grain milling or coffee, uh, that kind of thing. Um, all of those things are in bins. It's a very similar concept. We can set those up so that we are maintaining um, the relationship of a uh, of a uh, an, an asset like this pasteur pasteurizer to specific tanks that it can go to. And if that tank hits at the capacity, then it won't allow you to schedule over and above that capacity. Okay, so um, Chris, um, I, could, I could take any questions if there's any fresh ones on this or I can go ahead and move on. Nope, well, I think we're, we're set at the moment. Go ahead and, and just continue rolling on. Okay, all right, so for this next one, before I get into it, um, I'm gonna come back to this and um, I want to I want to explain a little bit of what I'm doing. It'll make a lot more sense if you can see it visually first before I before I go to the schedule and, and start running it. So basically, we have this model is a company that is making soups and sauces, and the way their process works is they've got a prep kitchen um, where everything is prepared, fresh foods are prepared, chopped, cut, whatever, whatever, whatever they need to prepare, just like you do in your kitchen before you throw everything into a kettle on top of the stove, a pot on the stove. And then once that has cooked, it goes through a, it goes down to a filler, which puts it into some form of bulk packaging, which then goes down to a chiller, and then ultimately goes to a packing area where it's packed out and shipped. So this is the flow. The arrows indicate fixed relationships. So the prep kitchen can feed any one of these, these kettles, but the kettles all have a fixed relationship to fillers. So we have these fill lines that have to be considered um, and have to be, uh, you know, we, we have to be sure that as we line work up, that we're doing it in such a way that um, everything will, you know, we're, we're going to avoid cross-contamination. Um, we have to consider that these fill lines need to be cleaned out as well as the, you know, like the fillers that they're going into and so forth. Um, and then finally, what we see then is the fillers have fixed relationships to specific chillers. Some of them, it's not quite as direct as others. And then we can see that we also then have um, everything is able to, the chillers are all able to go down to the packing. So that's what the picture looks like as the flow through their plant. But when it comes to scheduling and the way we schedule this, the way we go with this problem is we start with the bottleneck. In this case, the filler is the bottleneck. So what we do is we schedule the fillers, make sure that we're happy with the sequence that we have in place for those fillers. Then we do a second wave of scheduling using one of these rules that uh, Fraser was, was demonstrating and talking about. And using this rule, then we're able to, it, to schedule upstream to the kettles, but at the same time, then also honoring the sequence that we put together on the fillers, go downstream to the chillers and the packing area. And then finally, the last wave of scheduling that we do is the prep kitchen. Now, if you think about when you prepare food, um, you wouldn't chop up all your food for dinner before you go to work in the morning and leave it out on the counter and then come back when you get home from work and say, now I'm gonna get this meat that's been sitting out on the counter all day and these vegetables and everything, I'm gonna throw it in this pot. Um, no, you wanna prepare it right before it goes in. So this last step, then we do a backward schedule by due date so that it makes sure that everything is prepared just in time to go into the kettles. This is what I'm about to show you on the model that we're going to go into. All right. So as I promised, up here we've got kettles. We've got our fillers, which is our constraint point that we talked about. Um, below that, we've got chillers. We've got a packing area. And then we got our ingredient prep at the bottom, which we could actually have put at the top, but I did it to save real estate, I put it at the bottom. So this is what we're dealing with. And before I run the schedule, I want to point a few things out about this. So all of these um, jobs on here have some form of allergen in them. And so the, the rules that were written on here were, were done in such a way as to avoid cross-contamination at all costs. It's like the highest priority. So that when we line work up, we want to be sure that we're minimizing all of the setups that need to be done with, and by setup, I mean a wash down from one batch to the next. Um, and we also want to be sure that we know where these allergens are 
as well. So we have a lot of tools to do that. Um, we have, we're able to get all different kinds of product attributes um, and be able to bring them up on here and then just go through and start identifying, you know, where are all of my, you know, where are all the ones with milk in them or the milk and wheat, that type of thing. Um, or maybe I want to see, you know, specific recipes. Where are those specific recipes on my, in my orders in here somewhere? Or pack weights. Maybe I've got different pack weights and I'd like to keep track of the jobs that have, you know, all of my, uh, you know, two ounce pack weights or whatever that is. So we're able to colorize the board very dynamically. We're able to see the impact of the decisions that we're making. And we're able to see, um, you know, do a lot of what if in this situation and see it react very dynamically. So let's go ahead and let me show you what this scheduling looks like. So to begin, I'm going to just take everything that we had on the board. And to start with, I'm going to disable my secondary constraints. In this case, we have some secondary constraints, some pumps and some other tools that are needed that we have a limited amount of. For this first pass, I disable that so that I can get the optimal sequence without it having to consider any outside factors. And so that's the first thing that I'm going to do. So to begin with my scheduling, oh, I see what I just did is I just, uh, I forgot to set it to use the rule. So bear with me while this thing spins around and actually tries to schedule this backwards. And I apologize for that. So let me pull that off again. And what I need to do is to tell it to sequence forward using an APS rule. And we've got it set up here where I'm saying, I wanna load the filler operations first. I did remember to disable the secondary constraints. So we'll let that go through and do its work. And it has, because I have the compress overview on up here, it's showing me just the fillers that it's lining up. And as it lines these jobs up, the black bar, and I believe Fraser mentioned this, um, is set up, indicates setup time. So if we look at any one of these jobs, okay, it's telling me what to do next, which I know what to do, but it, it's nice that it gives me a reminder. So if we look at the setup on here, if I look, for instance, at this order right here, um, it's telling me that it does have gluten in it. It is organic. Um, it's got the allergens EMW. Uh, it doesn't have any seafood, but it's showing me it, and it's showing me the job that it followed. It didn't require any setup time. However, the job that follows it doesn't have, it doesn't have gluten. Um, it's organic, but it's not USDA, no seafood, et cetera. So it's telling me because of that, it calculated um, an hour of setup time that was needed to do the cleanup between this job and that job. And that's what this is doing. So in doing it this way, we're able to schedule the fillers. And then if the scheduler feels like they can make some tweaks to this based on knowledge that they have, that the scheduling algorithm didn't have, um, then maybe they know something just needs to be pushed ahead or done at a different time. So if I just grab something and say, well, if I move it here, I can, but it's going to, you can see the setup time that's going to occur. I could take it up here, same deal. There's setup time, a lot of setup time here because there's more allergens to clean out. Um, so I can just take this and I can go ahead and drop it somewhere, but the impact is immediate. You can see, well, there's going to have to be a big wash up because of this job here. And after I'm done with it, there's going to have to be another big wash up to get back to where we started. So that's probably not a good place to put that. So we'll put that back up where we had it. Um, Fraser showed you the repair schedule tool that we have um, where we can fix everything and then we can go from there. So this gives you an idea of what this first wave looks like. We're getting the optimal sequence, lining things up to minimize setup and um, reduce the risk of allergen cross-contamination. So now we go on to our second step. And this is where I'm going to load my prep through filling and I have re-enabled my secondary constraints. And now it's going to do some, it's doing some pretty heavy lifting right now. So there's a lot going on as it's working through, um, honoring the sequence that we put together on those fillers. Using that as the baseline, it's scheduling upstream to the kettles, downstreams to the chillers, um, the packing area, and then ultimately um, to basically where it's gonna be going out the door and you'll notice all the lines show that it's maintaining the relationships of the entire jobs and being sure that everything is sequenced 
in the proper order um, to honor the, the, uh, what we did on the fillers. Then in the next sequence, um, you know, we're going to be doing the reverse schedule that I talked about for the prep area. And that is, um, that is going to be coming up next here. So this is almost done. Um, and like I said, I just want to point out, it is doing a lot of work right now. And that's why it's taking so long to do this, because it is scheduling bidirectionally and it's taking into account allergens, uh, recipes, pack weights, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. So now it's telling me, okay, you've done your second, and the last thing you need to do is to schedule by due date. And so I will change this back to where I started because I forgot to do it before I started my demo today. Um, so now we are saying we're going to schedule backwards. But if you look at what we've done so far, we have everything lined up except for the prep area. So I've got all my kettles, fillers, chillers, everything looks like it's in pretty good shape. Let's go ahead and let it rip, do its last little bit schedule backwards, get everything in the prep area ready to go into the kettles, and we should be done now. So when I take this and I've got my, my focus on, this allows me then to go through and I can start seeing any job that I pick, I know it's going to be ready to go into the kettle immediately when it's needed. Once it's done with the kettle, through the filler, into the packing area, and, um, and down and finishing up into the chillers, into the packing area. And so this is the kind of thing, I mean, how long would it take you to do this with a spreadsheet? How difficult would it be to maintain all of these different variables? And even though this took about a minute to do, it only took a minute to do, you know, it's, it's a very simple process. Um, and uh, for, for, for this, once the logic has been laid out, once we understand what's important to you and what you are trying to accomplish with your schedule, we can write that type of intelligence into the tool and have it execute a schedule like this that you're then able to do what, you know, what Fraser showed you, um, you know, deliver uh, dispatch reports to people, um, et cetera. Okay, um, so at this point, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause and um, yep. you can take it, Chris. I guess we do have one question for you, Hans, that came through. Are you able to filter orders down based on criteria or, or attributes and schedule those products together? Um, sure, yeah, uh, you can absolutely do that. And that's a big part of what we see going on here so that you're able to highlight, uh, you know, you can highlight groups of orders um, and, you know, you could, you could lock them down and then remove everything else from the schedule and then go ahead and, and schedule a group of orders like that. Um, one way that people often will do that is use filters in here. So it might be that um, I wanted to find, I, don't, I wasn't quite prepared to answer that and I don't have a good example here, um, but it's sort of like I might be able to filter down to one particular item and, uh, and then you know, say that, all right, well, what I wanna do is get, you know, get just these items here I can highlight all of these on the board and lock them or remove them, however I want to do that. Uh, but basically, segregate them from the rest of the orders and then schedule some and then come back and schedule the others around it. It's very common that people will do that with orders that have a higher priority for a specific customer, uh, where you could take all of one customer's orders, schedule them first, and then you could schedule everything else in around it because that primary customer of yours, their stuff has to be done on time always. But you don't want to waste additional capacity, so that's when you schedule other things around it. So yes, the answer is yes, you can do that. Very good, I think that answered it perfectly. And that was the last question that we had uh, that, was, that was sent our way, Hans. Okay. Really appreciate uh, you all for joining us. We hope that you've been able to take away some valuable insight, information about the ways that Opsin or APS can benefit those of you in F&B. Uh, if you have additional questions or would like to have a more personalized demo, Again, like Hans said, feel free to reach out to us by using the contact information that you see on your screen now. Uh, we're going to leave this screen up for another minute or so, but we'd love the opportunity to learn more about you and provide you with any additional information that you may need. I sincerely hope you have a great rest of your day and week. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all.